Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Dr. Mark Spencer, Chief Executive Officer of Juma Ventures, an organization that enables low-income youth to enter college and obtain a four-year degree. Dr. Spencer has a 20-year career in the field, including as Business Development Director at Walden House, one of the nation's largest behavioral health and substance abuse agencies. Mark has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us today, and I'd like to thank you, Mark, for taking the time to meet with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell us a little bit about Juma Ventures, about the organization's origin and the mission as it's, as it's being expressed in programs today. Great. Juma Ventures has been around uh, since 1993, and we actually uh, started off really focused on workforce development. Juma Ventures was the creation of Dr. Diane Flannery, who was the executive director of Larkin Street, and her vision was to provide opportunities for homeless youth to actually have a, a job. And uh, what she realized is that being homeless and being young, there was a stigmatism attached to that. So she worked out one of the nation's first nonprofit franchise agreements with uh, Ben and Jerry's. And so we were operating retail scoop shops with uh, about 25 homeless youth. Retail scoop shops, you were selling ice cream? Yes. And we did this for uh, numerous years until um, we found that the business itself was not sustainable. It required heavy subsidies, and we were fortunate that we had uh, George Roberts from KKR that had just put together a uh, philanthropic arm called Red F, which was looking to uh, develop social enterprises. After seven years, we decided that uh, we wanted to see more impact in terms of the work that we were doing on the workforce development side of things, as well as um, having an opportunity to serve more youth. So we were working with 25 homeless youth, uh, and, and, and the business was actually um, losing a lot of money. We brought in some interns from a business school that looked at another uh, venture inside of sports stadiums, uh, where we're currently operating vending and concession operations in seven stadiums, two here in San Francisco, three in Oakland, and two down in San Diego. The program has changed from just being a workforce development agency into being a very comprehensive program where we're employing uh, young people in these enterprises, but when they're not working or in school, they come to our offices for supportive services, all geared towards uh, accessing higher education and, and degree attainment. So you start off with 25 youth in uh, serving ice cream. You now, years later, have a different structure. Um, you're, you're still focused on ventures, but you're also focused on education. How many youth are currently part of your programs? Annually, we're serving about 175 young people. Uh, we recruit young people that are coming into their junior year of high school, and it's a four-year model, so we work with them through the promotion of their uh, sophomore year in college. If these youth were not part of this program, what, what would their trajectory uh, be? And, and why would their uh, trajectory necessarily be um, along uh, particular lines? We target um, low-income, potential first-generation college-going youth primarily youth of color. Um, uh, statistically, this population uh, has high high school dropout rates and very low college going rates. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, the vast majority of these youth would not be entering and completing college degrees. And if they didn't have college degrees, what, what does that actually mean to their lives? There's a big debate going on in this country in terms of whether a college degree actually does make a significant difference. Well, our, our mission is to help our young people uh, navigate from poverty to prosperity. And the research shows that um, having a college education actually quadruples the likelihood of you earning uh, above uh, um, a poverty level income. And so uh, our focus is to help them understand uh, the importance of an education as it relates to a career. Is this about um, creating an opportunity or is this about uh, adding resource to an individual's life? We're definitely uh, considered a poverty alleviation type of program. And uh, what we're trying to accomplish 
is uh, working with young people to understand not only the importance of working, uh, but also uh, we have a very robust financial education and asset building program. So we're exposing young people to uh, the importance of having an understanding of a personal budget, understanding the importance of uh, delaying kind of the gratification, instant gratification of purchasing li liabilities mm -hmm. uh, and focusing on asset building. Uh, we've opened up bank accounts for over 700 of our participants. They've saved close to a million dollars uh, in this special fund called an individual development account. It's an incentivized match savings program where for every dollar they put in, we match it with two dollars. And then we complement that with all the um, services around um, understanding about time management, planning, and uh, the other kind of skills for success that you need for um, life and that you need for uh, college success. And by focusing on youth, uh, is, is your hope that, that these youth will then, when they have families of their own and, and uh, for their, their families, that they will help to promulgate that sensibility? Absolutely. So we're trying to break the cycle of poverty, basically. And um, by instilling in them a skill set and an understanding of the importance of you know, being work ready, the importance of you know, uh, seeing learning as a lifelong adventure. Um, and, um, and in many ways, we're a social justice agency, so we're encouraging our young people to give back to their communities and, and see the value in doing that. Do your young people also give back to Juma in terms of being mentors and, and coming in and, and uh, encouraging others in, in acquiring these skills? They do. Um, several of our college-going youth actually come back and, and serve as tutors. We have uh, a Juma alum on our board. Uh, we have some staff that are actually former participants. So we do our best to include them in the growth and development of the agency because, in our opinion, they know what success looks like and they can help us you know, make design changes um, as needed. Now, when you go to, uh, to funders, whether they're institutional funders, uh, foundations, um, business um, uh, philanthropies, or individuals, um, and you talk about the value proposition of investing um, philanthropic dollars into Juma, uh, what is the distinguishing characteristic, um, as opposed to other organizations, that also encourage people to uh, go to four-year colleges and, and provide the type of support? What differentiates us is that we have a very sustainable revenue model. Uh, these enterprises that I mentioned earlier in these sports stadiums actually uh, contribute about 35% of our annual budget. So those are earned income components that are going back into philanthropic purpose. Absolutely. So they're helping to sustain the programming that we offer. Uh, they're not quite break even, but the loss is, is minimal in terms of the opportunity that these businesses are providing for the young people. In addition to that, our track record in terms of uh, success in entering college is about 90% over the last three years. So investors are really seeing, one, from the sustainability side that this revenue model is attractive, and two, the impact in terms of where the youth are actually going and the success they're having is, 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 is important. So you have a number of different, uh, different arguments there. First, is for every dollar spent, you're actually getting a dollar thirty worth of impact because a dollar is spent, you're you're returning a third of your budget back through the enterprises. So there's a leveraged impact. Um, then there's a societal transformation. You're having an impact on individuals, uh, but also you're talking about future cost avoidance in terms of of future social services, which are enormously expensive. Absolutely. Um, about 10 to 15 of our young people have had, for example, um, experience with the juvenile justice system. Uh, we did some external evaluation and after two years, um, you know, uh, participating in Juma, the recidivism rate is, is very low for those that have had prior experience. So that's one example of a societal savings uh, where it costs about $35,000 to um, you know, incarcerate a young person each year, it costs us about ten to $15,000 a year to work with a young person. And then if you look at the wages that they'll earn over time from their college education and moving into a career, uh, it's, it's quite substantial. Could you talk a little bit about how you got into serving 
uh, this social justice cause. Why this? Why social justice? Why youth? It's a great question. I've had 20 years of involvement in working with the youth population. Uh, my, my career actually started as a high school teacher. I helped to develop an independent African American private school here in San Francisco. And then I went on to uh, the University of San Francisco's Upward Bound program, again working with uh, youth from low income, potentially uh, the first in their families to go to college. So I'm very passionate about doing that type of work because I've seen uh, the impact that the work can have on, on the individual level and on the community level. So when you invest your career in this type of activity, you're investing in someone else's life. And uh, the question that I have for you is, is when you are thinking about the result of that, what kind of, of changes do you wish to, to make in this society? Uh, through your, your personal investment, your personal bet of, of, of your own time, which is irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I always feel that the only thing truly stopping social change is the will for it. Um, is it the will of the individual, the will of society? Are there? I think it starts with the individual and moves up through the society. Um, and, you know, my personal um, time and energy that I spend on this, the, the hope is that um, my immediate community will see the impact of, of my work. So I live in West Oakland, for example, a very impoverished uh, community. Um, and uh, we serve West Oakland young people. And so my hope is that, you know, through the work of Juma Ventures, that, uh, you know, I'm going to increase the college going rate, I'm going to increase the uh, understanding of how to do community development well. Uh, and some of these young people will come back as teachers, will come back as um, peace officers, will come back as engineers and social scientists and, and help to uh, construct a, a, a vibrant and, and thriving West Oakland. So part of your objective is not to create an up and out kind of approach. It's really an up, out, and back in approach. Yeah, I, I would see it as, uh, you know, these young people um, are at the, at the lowest rung on the, on the ladder. And what I'm hoping to do is, is to move them up that ladder. And as they're moving up in the ladder, I'm hoping that they will see uh, opportunities to uh, give back as they're going up, helping other people go up as well. What kind of effect does the experience of, of these young people have on their families and on, on their communities as they're going through this and as they're um, are, are you detecting um, a, a shift that goes beyond the direct participants uh, in the program? That's interesting because in this economy uh, where there's high unemployment with the, the families that we work with and to see that uh, you know, the child actually has a, a job, a stable right. job, uh, you see a shift in terms of uh, the, the whole household. You know, we have somebody that has a job, perhaps I can go get a job. And then the financial literacy and, and, and work that we're doing around asset building. Some of our young people have actually saved enough money to help their families purchase a home. They also have relieved their families of the burden of having to pay for their college. And so they're saving money that's uh, allowing them to uh, go to college. And, and in many cases, our young people are going to college debt free. So the families are seeing stuff that they have not had uh, exposure to, and in many ways uh, weren't able to do themselves because of cer certain hurdles. And a very concrete example of that is we have uh, many of our uh, participants um, come from families where English isn't the primary language. So just to understand the bills and understand certain um, you know, applications and things like that, our young people are able to assist their parents or their relatives in, in, in filling out a job application or you know, understanding the importance of having a, a home budget, for example. So they transfer the learning that they're getting from Juma of, of developing their own budget because we do transitional budgets for our young people that are in their senior year going to college to make sure that they understand all the cost, housing, books, um, and all the miscellaneous things. So they can share that with their families so that their families now kind of operate differently. So a, a young person goes through your program 
and they're bringing some of this knowledge back to their, to their family. Do you help them uh, enter school? Um, do you help them through school? Describe a little bit about how your program works. We have a college admissions program where we're taking the young people on college tours, both uh, locally and regionally, so that get, they get exposure to private and public education settings. So some families that have never done this don't even know about college tours. Oh, absolutely. And, and just from an affordability stance, it's just out of their reach to take a trip down to San Diego and spend the night in a hotel and, and drive around and see various schools. So we do that college admissions work, uh, which entails uh, scholarship uh, support. We give out about $140,000 a year and these are uh, funds that we raise privately. And then we take care of the, um, the application process and the federal financial aid form. That's amazing. Now, how, how many people are part of uh, Juma Ventures? In San Francisco, we serve 80 uh, high school youth mm -hmm. uh, and then we have about uh, 25 college youth and over in the East Bay in Oakland we have about 30 high school youth and about 15 college going youth and then in San Diego we have uh, 50 high school youth that we're working with. And um, what does your staff look like? Very diverse uh, in terms of age, in terms of experience and background. Um, I think our average is about 26 and uh, they're all very vested in social justice and um, and we spend a lot of time and energy uh, defining what poverty means for us, understanding what social change looks like and feels like, um, and so that's kind of the, the glue that kind of unites all of us. How many in total? How many people? We have uh, 28 full-time staff and, and 50 plus volunteers. And, and your board? How large is your board? 16. 16, 16 board members. So uh, it's a unique board. So we have people like Tom Wyatt, who's the uh, CEO of Gap Old Navy. Uh, Scott Gorrell, who's the CEO of Ask.com, and then on the uh, nonprofit side, we have someone like Gerald Richards. He runs the local uh, National Foundation for Teaching Entrepreneurship. So it's a mixture of you know folks that are in the uh, for-profit sector and nonprofit sector. What is the motivation of the uh, of these uh, volunteers who serve on your board? That's a great question, uh, and I ask that question actually at each board <laughs> member. I, I select a board member to talk about why they actually uh, serve in their capacity at Juma. And what you'll hear is uh, some of them have uh, actually uh, come from poverty and they're very passionate about the mission. Uh, others uh, are really interested in our social enterprises. These are typically the, the venture capital folks or the, or the business folks that really appreciate that we have uh, an earned income model. Mm -hmm. uh, and then others uh, are, are very interested in this uh, holistic model that we have that integrates you know, employment with financial uh, education and asset building in combination with academic services. Internally, are you trying to drive to greater independence and, and higher revenue streams as, as you move forward in your various ventures? Absolutely. Uh, one of our goals is to break even on our, on our enterprises and, and uh, the closer we get to that, the higher that earned percentage is going to be in our overall budget. Uh, our strategy is to, to grow the enterprises in such a way that we can spread the risk so if one um, venue isn't performing well, another can kind of offset that, that, that loss. And so our vision is to continue to grow. Uh, we're in three cities now. In the next five years, we're hoping to be in another California city, uh, hopefully Los Angeles. Um, and uh, that, in my opinion, will ensure uh, the longevity of, um, of our business. A very powerful model. And I'd like to thank you very much, Mark, for sharing your insights with us today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you.